All right. Welcome, everyone, to the good, the bad, and the ugly. We're going to be talking about bills moving through the Colorado legislature today. Um, any announcements as far as ORMD goes? Uh, currently, Jiva is going to need help in the Town Hall uh, Parker Town Council race. Uh, she's running, and uh, other than that, uh, we don't really have a whole lot. Um, you can find events linked to help canvas for Jiva this weekend. Um, obviously, taking COVID precautions into account. Um, so check that out if you're available to Kate, who's going to discuss um, environmental bills going through the legislature. Awesome. Thank you, Weston. I'm going to share my screen. All right. Perfect. Awesome. Well, my name is Kate. I'm the Outreach Coordinator with Colorado Rising. For those of you that don't know me, I'm also on the council for our, our Revolution Metro Denver, and I use she, her, her, and hers pronouns. Um, thanks for having me today. So um, I'm going to present some bills that Colorado Rising is following, and yeah, let's get started. First, I'm gonna start with um, the management of plastic products, HB 21-1162. Um, this plastic packaging bill started in energy and environment. Uh, the prime sponsors are Alex Valdez, Lisa Cutter, and Julie Gonzalez. Um, this would be a plastic bag phase out from 2021 to 2023 in grocery stores and restaurants. Um, businesses must provide recycled paper bags or plastic bags at 10 cents. And this tax will go towards recycling, compost, and water diversion programs. Alex Valdez uh, did a really cool research project. He went down to Restaurant Depot, um, and he, re he realized that a lot of the um, more eco-friendly options that we have are when you go to like a food truck and you see that they use like a, a cardboard bottom and a tin foil on top. So we'll start seeing more, more options like that that are more um, recycle friendly um, and then going on towards schools right now schools are using still using polyester in school trays for lunch um, and those will be phased out as well uh, the head of nutrition in Weld County testified and they stated that Weld County spends $180,000 on polyester trays that are not recyclable and these are being thrown into our landfills every school day um, so the price will increase um, obviously because it needs to cover labor and water and it will go up to $300,000. Um, of course, restaurants and school nutri nutrition services aren't happy about this, but they are still being supportive um, and they're deciding to stay neutral on the bill, which is helpful for its chance to pass. Um, there haven't been many amendments besides um, it's um, being placed on a longer timeline by year. Um, this will be helpful for schools, um, correction, nutrition programs, and prisons to um, get on that timeline. And municipalities are allowed to create stricter rules. So we really do hope to see this pass. Um, for example, we could see, start to see maybe like plastic utensils, bands and stuff like that. Does anyone have any questions for that one? Perfect. I can also take questions at the end if you think of anything. Um, so going on, um, HB 1189, uh, regulate air toxics. toxics. Um, obviously we have a concern for um, our public health with our air recently, um, and this addresses our emissions. Um, so the sponsors behind this is Alex Valdez, Julie Gonzalez, Adrian Benavides, and Dominic Marino. Um, so this passed through energy and environment and will be in finance on Monday. This bill targets petroleum refineries. Um, these facilities are already self-reporting numbers, but this would be the first step to cutting down toxic air. If high spikes of benzene, hydrogen cyanide, hydrogen sulfide is in the air, there has to be a notification sent to the community. Um, and if they violate state requirements, they have to take action within 15 days. And all of the outreach needs to be done in Spanish and English. Um, as we know, a lot of these communities are uh, a more big majority of them do speak Spanish. Um, so it's really important that everyone can communicate like that. Um, and then this bill is, we think this bill is a good starting point, um, but not the whole ball game to address the biggest issue. Um, so we're still watching this closely to see how many more amendments get added on to weaken the bill as it will likely face opposition in the Senate. Any questions with that one? Cool. 
Um, so next, the voluntary reduced greenhouse gas, HB21-161. Uh, this is a reduction of greenhouse gas emissions by natural gas utilities. Uh, this is being sponsored by Chris Hansen, John Karam, Jenny James Arndt. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Um, there will be a hearing in the Senate Transportation and Energy on Tuesday. And this bill requires the reduction of methane transportation and delivery, such as pipelines and carbon dioxide from the customers. Um, municipally owned utilities can opt in, but aren't required to. Uh, the utilities are given flexibility in how they meet the reduction goals, but they're required to meet them unless it will cost them more than 2% of their total income. Uh, this bill is a little confusing as well, but the way we read it is that folks are given the opportunity for flexibility in meeting these reduction goals. <clears throat> and if they opt in, they have the additional requirements on them. They won't have the additional requirements on them. Um, this bill also allows the COGC to issue permits that will allow inject injection of carbon dioxide to basically bury it away from the atmosphere. So that's super interesting. Uh, we'll definitely be watching this one and we haven't made a full decision to support it yet. Um, I would say for like talking about like the good, the bad and the ugly, the word voluntary is definitely like um, a red flag. So I think we're still like watching it, not making any commitments yet. Um, and then moving on, um, this one um, is really exciting. So the reduced, reduced greenhouse gases incre increase environmental justice bill. This is SB 21200. Um, this goes further into environmental protections, adopting measures to reduce emissions of greenhouse gases and adopting projections for impact to communities. Uh, the sponsors are Faith Winter, Dominic Marino, Dominic Jackson. Uh, Dominique Jackson. Um, this will be, there will be a hearing in tra transportation and energy on Tuesday. Um, this is a big one. Um, it's going to take steps to ensure that we meet our reduction goals and create programs to specifically focus on environmental justice and environmental racism. Um, I don't know if any of you remember, but back in 2019, Jared Polis said that when, it, when SB 181 was signed into law, he was like, this is the end of the war between oil and gas and environmentalists, which is definitely not true. We still have tons of issues. Our communities are still being poisoned. So he was saying that there won't be any new regulations until 2022 stance. So this is people fighting back against that. Um, and we, we love to see that. Um, so we suspect, suspect this bill to be a big fight. And if it does pass, it will likely be significantly wa watered down. Um, so we're keeping an eye on this one. Going forward. Um, so there were a few that did not pass committee. Um, the right to use natural gas was killed in the committee, which is great news. Uh, this would have made it illegal um, for me uh, municipalities to phase out natural gas. Um, their biggest argument was the right to use gas stoves, uh, which is ridiculous. Like we can all move forward and use electric stoves. They're much healthier for you and safer. Um, and then uh, the adopt renewable natural gas standard was killed in the committee. Um, so this one was definitely very complex and confusing. It didn't really um, fuels. Um, so we think that like there aren't many bad bills going through, luckily, um, because the majority is um, democratic. So um, we haven't really seen anything out of the committee that we really have to fight yet. So yeah, that is the positive side of it. And yeah, that's it from me. Um, should we check on questions? I, I think there was, I saw a question earlier, but I think it got answered in the chat. Nita was asking on, I think it was maybe the third bill you were talking about, if there were any Republicans as co-sponsors. Yeah, a and, lot of, a few of these were bipartisan, I believe. Yeah. Okay, so it looks like there's no really bad ones going through and there's some good ones going through that are probably going to get watered down. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we're watching that. Um, and the the only the plastic spill one was the one that it hasn't really been watered down. Like I said, it's just so like <clears throat> schools can like meet the timeline and prisons and just all the nutrition services. So that one's looking really good. Um, and yeah, I can keep everyone posted with the amendments, obviously. Looks like Owen has Which a question. Not no. No. Yeah. Um, 
I just I'm not, I didn't catch it if you said it, but um, do you, are any of these in particular need of support? You know, I mean, are they, are they on a, you think they're sailing through or do they need um, phone calls or testimony or anything like that? Yeah, great question. Thanks for asking that. Um, so we think plastics is either going to be on the floor next week or the following week. And we will be making a call to action Colorado Rising on Earth Day. Um, so definitely follow our page and I'll like Slack the channel if we are asking everyone to call their representatives that week. And then I'll keep everyone posted with the other ones as well. I love what Cleo said about he put the word voluntary in. Yeah, um, that's, I know, I've heard Hansen can be like, kind of like greenwashy. He was also, in, he's all, he was also involved with the um, adopt renewable natural gas um, one. So it seems like the greenwashing ones are being shut down. Is that Chris Hansen, um, Denver City Council? Yes, I oh, think. Oh, no, he's, he's, like not Denver City, he's not Denver City Council. He's my state senator. He, he started, oh, okay. yeah, yeah. Yeah, he started yeah. as a, yeah. he started as a House of Representatives person right. and then got appointed to the Senate. But here's the right. thing. Before he even ran for the House, he was in the oil and gas industry. Okay, yeah. I remember him now. I remember he had a primary. I can't remember the challenger's name. Yeah. I was I was confusing with Chris Hines on, on City I, Council. Yeah. That doesn't yeah, sound he had, right. He, he had challenges from um uh, what was his name? Uh, he had challenges with M Michelle Fry was running against him. Maria uh, Orms. Maria Orms. Oh, no, no. That, that was, was later. It. That was late. That was later. He had uh, uh, when he went ran for the house. His challenge. His challenges were uh, Michelle Fry and Jeff Hart. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. The most recent was um, Maria. was Maria Orms. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Remember now. Thank you. Um, yeah, Cleo, I just saw your um, question about the voluntary bill. Yeah, this is definitely one that we're still watching um, because of Chris Hansen and um, the word voluntary. So um, it's still a, a lot of these are in the phase of we're eyeing them down. Um, and there's also other there's still other bills that I haven't addressed tonight. There's like a dozen of them. Um, so just like keep an eye out and I'll keep everyone updated updated on that. Um, yeah, and Maria Orms was the challenger, Wendy. I love Maria. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there any other questions? Let's see. Kate, I just have a quick question, <clears throat> not entirely related, but uh, obviously related. Who would you recognize as the kind of environmental champions in the legislature right now? Um, hmm. I would say I've seen like Julie Gonzalez name a lot and Alex Valdez. I've seen their names on a lot. Um, and I know with um, recently with the CDPHE uh, whistleblower that um, Alex Valdez uh, wants to like take charge of like the oversight committee hearing if like if uh, they do go forward with an investigation. So he seems like really interested with helping um, with helping helping out and like holding people accountable with the um, unlawful permits being issued. So I was excited to see that. Um, does anyone else have, think it, uh, does anyone else have anyone that comes to their mind? Faith Winner? Yeah. Yeah. Steve Fenberg. Anything uh, yeah. I, th I think Sirota was a sponsor on the plastics bill too, right? I'm not sure. Uh, uh, let me see. Lisa Cutter. Okay. Yeah. I think there's another plastic bill going through, so that their name may be on the other one. Right. I haven't looked into that one yet, though. Yeah, I vaguely remember seeing her name on a plastic bill. Mm -hmm. I wish we could find a way to expose Chris Hansen. <laughs> because somehow he has the reputation of being an environmentalist somehow. Yeah. So just like yeah. a, I, I totally agree. I have a friend yeah. who um, is kind of duped for him. I don't know how else to put it. <laughs> yeah. 
I heard that, yeah, he like gets paid off to do talks for the industry. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, and I also heard that he like, he's super intelligent. So I don't know if that like, that has something to do with it. Like people are like- He's like, very oh. charismatic. I, yeah. <laughs> Yes, he is. And he's young and HD6 loved him and now third, Senate District 31 is in love with him and I don't know why. I, I think we need, to do follow, follow the, we need to do follow the money and look at who's donating to his campaign. That is pretty telling. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah, I wonder if we could yeah build something together, to be honest about that. Um, because... You know who's great? Who's great at doing that research and loves it is Dale Nichols. Uh -huh. He to work for the state, and I—I I mean, he is so good at that. He can uh -huh. do the heartbeat. So oh my I, gosh, that would be yeah. great to do something, expose them, exactly. You know, before I mean, Dale, during the, their campaigns, right, you know, and but hold Dale their is, feet to the fire. Yeah, uh, maybe we should have somebody reach out to Dale and ask him to do that. Good idea, Anita. Okay, because I can right. speak for him that he, he does love doing that. <laughs> okay, fantastic. All right, who do we have next? Thank you so much, okay. Kate. Who do we have next on the agenda? We've got Terry with Renner's Right. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I'm Terry Tucker. And, One sec, uh, Terry. Uh, yep, I just wanted to share my screen. Thanks. Susan is sharing my screen for me tonight because my work platform had to go down in long story, but we figured it out. So there's only three that are, you know, really grabbed my attention. There's a lot of very good bills and there's, we were talking a little bit with who's the environmental um, primary sponsors, but with renters rights in housing, it's always Julie Gonzalez. She is like the one who puts out the majority of the good stuff, but they haven't been winning. <laughs> and so today, <clears throat> the very first one is Senate Bill 173. This one was great. Um, however, today it did pass on third reading with a bunch of amendments. So I had to go back in and see what changed. And it was quite a bit. And initially, we were trying to limit the late fees to 2.5%. Well, negotiations made it 5% or $50. The grace period originally was 14 days. That was cut down to seven. Um, this, is, this bill is primarily to stop the abuse that people are getting evicted simply over late fees. So this bill prohibits that. I put in bold on my handout what the Colorado Apartment Association says about these bills, and they say absolutely ridiculous things. Like you can set a reasonable standard, but we only want it to be three days, and we want a higher um, uh, late fee. We don't want any of these caps. So it just doesn't make any sense. Their objections are saying, okay, do something reasonable, but what they want is completely unreasonable. Um, it does think it does extend some of the cure period to allow people to continue to try to catch up their rent before the end of an eviction. Um, and it does forbid landlords from forcing tenants to pick up the global legal fees, which is something that they always do, like mine and yours. Um, and it makes it easier to withhold the rent when the home is in poor condition. That's a follow-up to this great warranty of habitability law that was passed last year that I took advantage of, which says you have to provide a basic minimum, like a stove or refrigerator, um, certain basic minimums. If you don't have that, you can withhold your rent. Um, the one really important thing about this new <clears throat> bill, if it passes, because we've seen substantial amendments already, is that it gives you a right to trial by jury. And that's, that would be something fantastic to get rid of these. You're in court one day and three days later, a sheriff is there to evict you. And that does happen. Um, so we don't know yet. I mean, it's still in a negotiation phases and it's still got to get all the way through the Senate and then go on to the House. The next one is House Bill 1121. S similar provisions 
trying to go after the length of time, how quickly you can get an eviction. You really can get an eviction in, in less than 19 days. We were trying initially to get these this extended to about 42 days, which is 12 days of your court and a month to find a new place to live. Well, that's not happening. Something that Julie, um, I'm sorry, Serena had to say about this is that what she's fighting is a system that has existed forever based in racism, power, and money. And so we can only do it in incremental pieces. That gets my goat anytime I hear the word incremental. So what we can do are find the Democrats to object and talk to them about incrementalism. Like, okay, it, it's similar in my mind to the, the $15 an hour minimum wage. We've been talking about that since 2015. And yet when we were trying to get it through a platform, they still wanted another five years. So you're looking at these long periods of time that just continue to allow the corporations to make money on the backs of the poor. And, but that one did pass the House. It's going to the Senate. Um, it's, it, but it's been weakened substantially. We had really high hopes for this bill, and it's been weakened. That just happened in the last few days. There's another one that I'm watching, and it's to give local governments the authority to promote affordable housing. There was a Supreme Court ruling in Colorado that said developers can't be forced to include lower cost housing units in developments. And that's a disaster because as they want to build these new developments, that's something we want them to do is make a piece of them affordable housing. So there's, there's legislation that's been proposed to try and get around that. It did pass the House. Something interesting about the opposition to me is that the Colorado Apartment Association thinks that this puts the entire burden of affordable housing, not on society as a whole, but only on the other residents of the community. I'm struggling to understand that objection. Shouldn't it be the community? For instance, I live, I've rented, I'm a renter. I live in a, a small condo um, association. Why shouldn't it be my neighbors and my burden to make sure that there is a, there are some families that can live here and be in an affordable unit, but in a really nice condo association. I believe we sh it should be the neighborhood. You know, that's the problem is that these suburban neighborhoods lock you out. Well, that just adds to it when you won't allow an individual community make these decisions. That's my humble opinion. Can you go to the next page? Um, Oh, it's scrolling. Great. There are some other ones that are really good bills. The, they're very noteworthy, but for instance, House Bill 1054, it's housing benefits for the undocumented. That's already been sent to the governor. And so that's really good news. Then there's one that I found really interesting that allows tenants to build a credit rating by reporting their rent payments to credit agencies. That's sitting in committee. I don't know if it's gonna go anywhere, but I know as a renter, that would be a boon to me. You know, the majority of what I pay every month is rent. Um, I don't have a whole lot of other expenses. So that would be a The same thing with um, an annual report on affordable housing. I think that's a great bill to force the, the state to look at this. Let's start getting the data. Let's have a report of what kind of affordable housing we have, what the various cities are doing, um, and where we have the holes and where we need more funding. Now, this last one that's noteworthy is House Bill 1108, the Gender Identity Non-Discrimination Bill. <clears throat> and to me, it's 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 a wonderful bill. I mean, it just plain means you can't discriminate in housing, and we know it occurs. We absolutely know it occurs. Um, so that one has passed the House, and it's now into the Senate. There is one other big housing measure, especially if you live in Denver. Um, it's called Newer, No Eviction Without Representation, and it's a ballot initiative. It's going to be on Denver residents' ballots, hopefully. 
this fall if they collect enough signatures. That's the one that they are trying to get enough signatures to get this on the ballot. Boulder did pass this. And there was an article that I read about uh, a young woman who it, it benefited really a lot in Boulder. She was about to be evicted, no lawyer. And we all know that without a lawyer, you're going up in court against lawyers. That makes certain things like walk away settlements that that doesn't get negotiated for you if you don't have an attorney and a walk away settlement especially if the landlord is like sick of you and just wants you out a walk away could protect you from having all this information on your record like an eviction and you can't find a new place to live it's a vicious circle you know once you're evicted finding housing again becomes just it, it you stay trapped um so i've participated in their working group and it's a group of dsa folks who have put this together i'm pretty sure they did the boulder initiative and they are very um excited to have this going in denver and they need help so i did put some contact information just the email for harsha if you can go around and get some signatures they're doing training every weekend they have one this weekend it's sunday from one to four and they train you before you go out. One, one thing, if you want to read the language of the ballot initiative, I just dropped it into the chat. Because this is something, of course, I'm going to scoop up and, and try and get <laughs> happening in Jeffco. <laughs> so, but that's why I've been helping them. I want to see what we can do to bring this into other communities. And uh, they're very organized. They're, they're organizing on a platform called Discord which I'd never used before. It's new to me, but it's very similar to Slack. If you've used Slack, you can probably use Discord. And I did tell them that I was going to reach out and try and get them some help to get out and get these signatures. So does anybody have any questions? I'm Nita? Yeah. So uh, I'll be, I do consulting for HUD housing authorities, and I'll be real curious to see how this meshes with uh, requirements that has, HUD has, because there's federal regulations, like there's certain situations, I'm not defending this, I'm just saying, mm, right. situations where housing authorities, as per federal regulations, are required to terminate someone's housing, and then if they don't leave, they evict them. Um, so I'm, I'll, I'll be curious to see how this meshes with federal regs. Well, what it will do if newer passes is it gives those people the right to a lawyer um, against HUD. <laughs> so they would right. have, no, which is, you know, it's part, a balance that, of power. Yeah. Yeah. It's that a balance part, no, I think, of power. No, I think that part is good. I mean, I just did a hearing today for yeah, someone who's getting evicted. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the bills are a lot about the money involved, you know. Um, and some of it is has to do with these really egregious landlords who start charging you 50 bucks for the first day and then you know 10 days later you owe another whole month's rent just in late fees it's just gotten out of control and somebody needs to stop that plus there's a time issue we all know what it's like looking well if you've been renting for a while you know what it's like looking for a place to rent in denver it's hard um, there's just no housing. There's no housing for anybody. And uh, saying that you're going to be evicted in a 19-day period of time, if you have a family, to me, that is just immoral. You just do not do that to people. It's flat out immoral. And the moratorium, the federal moratorium lasts until June 30th. But what do we do after that? There is COVID money. And I didn't um, go over all of the, the bills that are providing funding, but there's a lot of funding bills and a lot of appropriations trying to make, get going this housing money before the federal moratorium lifts. And so there is money and people can apply for it. My concern is those people who don't know that bucket of money is there, have not applied and then in, on June 30th, boom, they get a bill for $10,000. And if they don't pay, they, they get booted out in 19 days. 
I mean, it, it can get really bad if we don't do something in advance. So they have recently allowed the renter themselves to apply for the money rather than making it the burden of the landlord. The renters can now apply for, the, for it. And I'm hoping that with this ballot initiative, we can kind of get the word out that there is a bucket of money and people need to start applying for it right now. And I'm sorry, I can't see the chat questions. I, does it look like we had chat questions? We oh, Wendy, Wendy, tell us about that. Sure, yeah, no, I literally was on a coalition call uh, just right before this one and uh, they announced that Woodrow is gonna be introducing an, uh, an eviction moratorium bill. Uh, in the state ledge that goes beyond the the national CDC order. Um, okay. So I, that's literally all I know, uh, but I'm definitely okay. going to keep my eyes peeled for when that lands. Okay. Right. I didn't see it when I was doing my where status review today. Yeah, I think I didn't. I it. think it's in drafting. I don't think it's introduced yet, but it okay. should be soon. Okay. Okay. Well, that's that gives us some hope, but. Um, the big problem is that people, you know, uh, working class and poor folk don't have access to the systems, um, things like lawyers. We have got to start providing that. And I have personal experience with this. When I got a 35% increase in my rent after I had complained about the, the warranty of habitability, I, I was get, went to a fellow, it was Woodrow, who gave me an organization that helped me and we did a walk away, um, but I had a lawyer, you know, to work something like that out. And I just, you know, feel like housing is a human right and we have a right, or people have a right to have an attorney before someone yanks the roof over their head away. That's just my humble opinion. Not very humble. <laughs> I think it's a right. <laughs> So I will keep watching all these bills and keep everybody updated. Are there any other questions? I'm trying to stick to the time limit I was given. Yep, I think, I think we're good. Okay, yeah. well Thank you. then, it's time for me to introduce Wendy. Yep, uh, so I'm gonna run through real quick and I'm gonna share my screen here. Uh, some of the labor, uh, worker justice, immigrant justice, and racial justice bills in the legislature. And there are a lot of them. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to run through them and take questions at the end. Um, so first up for worker justice, uh, this is one of the most contentious bills in the legislature right now. Uh, and that is the agricultural uh, workers' rights bill. It would allow, it's essentially the farm workers' bill. It would give farm workers actually actual organizing rights, um, you know, which like I think we all know, like the Chicano movement was born out of the farm workers' movement in California, uh, but farm workers here have never enjoyed uh, the kind of rights that farm workers were able to win in California. And so, uh, this is both a worker justice and a racial justice issue because farm workers are predominantly uh, an immigrant workforce and an of color workforce. Um, that bill is currently in the Senate Appropriations Committee. It definitely needs a lot of help um, to get out of the Senate. Uh, the thinking is if it gets through the Senate, it'll probably be fine in the House, but it has to get through the Senate. So. Um, this one is also uh, in it's a, it affects immigrant workers. So this is the, it has a really unremarkable bill title, um, but it's, it's, people are calling it the left behind workers bill. Essentially a lot of immigrant workers did not qualify for unemployment um, because they were immigrants. And this bill fixes that. Uh, it, it's in the Senate business labor and I think it's technology committee. I always forget what the T stands for um, right now. Uh, and similarly, if it gets out of the Senate, uh, it likely passes through the House. 
Uh, and then this is another big one. Uh, unsure if it's going to actually pass this legislative session, but they want to start the conversation at least and in hopes of getting it through next year if they can't get it through this year. Um, and this bill is not yet introduced, um, but it's local employee, uh, local public employee collective bargaining. So we passed collective bargaining for state employees last year, uh, but this would grant the right to collective bargain and guarantee the right to collective bargaining and organizing unions uh, to school districts, uh, municipal, county employees, uh, other public employees, not at the state level. I'm just up for now. Uh, all right, so on racial justice bills, there's a lot of bills. These are primarily ACLU bills uh, dealing with the criminal legal system and civil liberties coming out of the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, one is jail population man management, SB 62. Um, this is the other highly, highly, highly contentious bill. Uh, it's certainly near the top for the most contentious bills in the legislature right now. Um, this bill, among other things, eliminates cash bail uh, and does a lot of other great stuff um, to reduce jail populations, to reduce mass incarceration in our state. It's currently in the Senate. It passed its first committee. It's currently in Senate appropriations. Um, you know, a lot of things are being held up in the appropriations committees right now, uh, which is interesting. Uh, but this one is another one, I would say definitely give a call on. Um, this bill, Senate Bill 31, it's in Senate Judiciary, hasn't moved very far yet. Uh, but, you know, I think we all have seen at some point that police like to give, you know, orders to disperse. Uh, you know, they deem a, a protest unlawful um, far earlier than they need to when the protest is still peaceful and it actually escalates things, doesn't help anything. Um, and so this bill would actually put pretty strict guidelines on what constitutes an unlawful protest so that that practice is ended uh, and police can't just shut down a protest because they don't like it, basically. Uh, Senate bill or House Bill 1250, uh, Senate Bill 217 was the big criminal justice reform bill that passed last year, um, police reform bill. Um, this bill has a couple of other uh, added things to it. Um, in, in particular, one provision is um, the SB 217 uh, created actual liability for local police officers um, so that they could be sued uh, if they engage in, if they, you know, kill or maim someone essentially. Um, this bit, like this bill, bans that to the state patrol, which wasn't included in two, SB 217 as one example. And there's a lot of other provisions, some of them technical, some of them substantive, uh, but essentially it builds on the foundation built by Senate Bill 217. Um, that's also in its first committee still, House Judiciary. Um, jail phone calls, uh, right now, so jail phone calls, I don't know if y'all know this, but like uh, every phone call into or out of a jail in Colorado um, is is managed by a for-profit private operator that price gouges. Mm -hmm. uh, it's pretty egregious, especially when you think like folks who are trying to like communicate with the, you would think that you would want to encourage folks who are incarcerated communicating with the outside world because in theory that helps with rehabilitation. I don't know, and preparing people to re-enter uh, post-incarceration right? and uh, yeah, no, instead they get price gouged. Um, they and their families get price gouged and it's ridiculous. Uh, so this bill creates some guidelines around that and also creates a lot more transparency around that practice and the pricing and all of that good stuff. Okay. Um, that's in house, that's uh, also, it's passed its first committee in the house uh, and it is currently in house appropriations. Uh, Chemical restraints, so sedatives uh, trend and, um, oh, I lost the word, but stuff like ketamine, stuff that killed Elijah McLean. Uh, this a House Bill 1251 would create a lot of restrictions 
around the use of those things um, and you know when it is actually appropriate for first responders to use them um, so that they are a last resort rather than a first resort essentially um, and their, their need has essentially been demonstrated uh, prior to their application. That's in the, in, still in its first committee as well in House Judiciary. And then last but certainly not least, um, there is a bill to reduce juvenile incarceration, which is Senate Bill 71. Um, that directly reduces the number of juvenile beds in Colorado. Uh, and it eliminates cash bail for juveniles completely because you know if we we certainly shouldn't be doing it for adults either but we sure as hell shouldn't be holding holding kids in jail because they can't pay cash bail that's stupid um and that passed its first senate committee uh and is currently in senate appropriations all right immigrant justice some really good stuff here um so this also really obscure bill title. <laughs> um, basically, we have, we still have on the books, uh, thanks to the anti-immigrant special session uh, that happened in 2006, I want to say it is, um, some show me your papers laws when it comes to accessing public benefits. Um, and this bill removes a lot of that uh, so that immigrants can access benefits if we've learned anything during COVID, it's, you know, we're all in this together. So uh, yeah, we don't need to be checking people's citizenship papers before we give them help. Uh, that's just dumb. Uh, that's in its first committee, Senate State Affairs. That's Senate Bill 199. There's an immigrant legal defense fund, much like Terry was talking about with uh, tenants. All tenants should have the right to a lawyer. Uh, right now, immigrants in detention uh, are not provided with public lawyers. Um, and we know because the immigration system is so convoluted and complicated, um, immigration law is particularly complex, that immigrants who have lawyers are much, much more successful uh, in winning their cases. Um, and so this creates a legal defense fund to provide attorneys to any immigrant who needs them, any immigrant detention who needs them and make sure that they all have representation. That per passed its first house committee. Uh, it's in house appropriations currently. Uh, immigrant data privacy limits essentially the data that the state can share with ICE um, and immigration authorities um, to make sure that, you know, I, nobody is handing over lists to ICE essentially based on whatever, uh, whatever lists exists at the, at the state level, benefits applications, driver's licenses, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that also passed its first Senate committee uh, and has moved on to Senate appropriations. Uh, and then U visas. Um, U visas are essentially, if you are an immigrant uh, who is undocumented, um, but you are a witness to a crime or a victim of a crime, um, the prosecutor can offer you a U visa to essentially protect you from being deported and, and encourage you to come forward uh, publicly and not be afraid of being in the court system. Um, but some on some right wing prosecutors, let's just say, don't do that very well. Um, and so this creates standards around that and around how, uh, how quickly U visas will be certified uh, for immigrants, which is the big problem. They just kind of sit on the paperwork and never certify the U visa uh, for folks who need one. Um, that one has actually passed the House completely, and it's now in its first Senate committee. Um, and then multilingual ballot access for voters. You kind of think, hey, uh, if, you, uh, if, you, if your first language is not English, I don't know about you, but, you know, some of the ballot initiative descriptions are confusing enough in English as my first language. I can't even imagine reading them if it wasn't. Um, and so essentially this bill makes sure that those who need a ballot in a language other than English uh, are going to be able to access a ballot in a language that they are most comfortable in. Uh, and that is currently in the House Appropriations Committee. So I know that was a lot. I'm happy to share these slides. I'm also happy to take any questions.
how likely are many, I mean, you covered a lot of bills here to, to pass and, and who would be the primary opposition to these bills? Oh, it uh, depends on the bill, but the biggest objection in general is anything that costs money. Uh, gotcha. And like that comes from within the, Demo you know, comes from the neoliberals within the Democratic caucus as well. Um, literally anything that has a price tag attached is getting questioned hard, um, no matter how good the policy. And so that is the biggest obstacle for some of these bills that have a fiscal not attached. Um, but, you know, in general, I would say all of these things are hot buttons for a lot of folks. Uh, for example, I'll give you one, the Ag Workers Bill, uh, which is a priority bill for WFP. Um, it is, you know, one of the folks who opposes it is Carrie Donovan, because guess what? She's a ranch owner. And like, you know, some, some folks have vested business interests of their own uh, that conflict with, the, with what is actually good policy, right? So it, I would say that our legislature is not as strong as it could be on racial justice or labor issues in general. That's frankly part of the reason WFP was founded in Colorado. Um, we're getting there, certainly in the House, have a lot, still have some, some ways to go in the Senate. Um, but yeah, there is both moderate Dem opposition and certainly Republican opposition to a lot of these bills. And oh, let me see. Actually, I'll stop sharing my screen so I can actually see the chat here. Are we, are we sure it's not just bigotry? Yeah, Terry, that's part of it. <laughs> that is. <laughs> yeah. Owen, does that mean yeah. you have a question? <laughs> yeah, I do. Thank you. Um, so with the one that was uh, <clears throat> um, left behind unemployment bill, mm -hmm. uh, how does that interact with federal requirements? Um, yeah. You know? okay. Yeah. So immigrants already are ineligible for federal unemployment insurance. So like the boost that the federal government gives uh, immigrant workers or certainly undocumented workers would not be eligible for. Um, but the state unemployment fund is completely controlled by the state. And so the state can do what it wants with the state unemployment fund. So that's what that bill is about. So the percentage, uh, you know, if, if, a, if somebody who's getting unemployment now uh, gets 100%, what per, would they be getting, would the immigrants be getting 100% on this or because the federal would not be part of it, is there less than 100%? That's a good question. I'd have to look. Uh, really, like from my perspective, what immigrant workers are getting down from unemployment is zero. So yeah. I will take whatever I can get sure. out of the state fund. All right, well, without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Jim Potter because I know he's got a hot topic for us to talk about too. Jim, you're on mute. You're on mute, Jim. So thank you everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm the uh, legislative coordinator for the Colorado Foundation for Universal Healthcare. And basically we follow you know, healthcare bills, but we also recognize that there are a lot of other bills because there are social determinants of health that may be just as important as some of the straight up healthcare bills. So we do kind of venture away from time to time to support bills that are not strictly healthcare legislation, but that certainly impact people's health. Uh, this, this legislative session, uh, we've been following, I don't know, probably six or seven straight up healthcare bills. And of those that we have been following, there are about three that are left in the hopper now. The others have either uh, passed uh, both houses and are awaiting the governor's signature, or they got postponed indefinitely from the get-go. 
And so I just want to discuss briefly two of the three bills that we're still looking at. Uh, and then I'm going to spend a little more time on the big bill that is causing such controversy. And that's the Dylan Roberts bill, uh, the public, the so-called public option bill. But uh, first, you know, I, I should mention that we support the uh, House Bill 21-1232. It's the Sonia Jaquez Lewis bill. It's called standardized, it, well, I'm sorry, uh, wrong bill. It's Senate Bill 21-175, the Jaquez Lewis uh, Pharmacy Review Board, which would actually have the power to limit high-end drug prices. And it would have the ability to monitor and to determine if the prices of drugs are really out of line with the cost of production and other factors. We think that's a really important bill to support because drug prices, as we all know, are out of control. So that bill uh, is still, a w it's in the Appropriations Committee right now, and we do not have any scheduled hearings on it, but we're keeping an eye on that bill. Uh, the other bill that we have been keeping an eye on is House Bill 211068, and that's uh, an incremental bill, but we think it's an important bill because it requires health insurers to cover annual mental health exams. And uh, we know that that's really an important thing to do. If we catch things early, then we can correct them early, and we can actually save money on health care through that kind of monitoring of people's mental health status. Uh, the third bill uh, is the one that I want to talk mostly about, and that's uh, the Dylan Roberts bill, House Bill 1232. It's called Standardized Health Benefit Plan Colorado. And really what that does uh, is it creates uh, phases toward a public option that would be run by a state agency and would offer health insurance, a standardized health insurance plan that anyone can buy into on Connect for Colorado and in the small group uh, health insurance market. Now, one of the reasons that we uh, support different bills is if it will, if it will advance the cause of universal health care. So the pharma bill, uh, we think, does that. We think the public option bill does that. And the other thing that we look at is who's opposed to the bill and what is their economic interest. And with all three of these bills, we're seeing opposition to them. And so we like to take positions on bills, especially where they can inhibit or limit the power of big pharma or big hospitals or big insurance companies. And we think all three of these bills have at least some characteristics that lead us to think that we should support them. Now, the, in terms of the public option bill, to describe it more fully, it, it comes in two phases. The first phase is that insurance companies that sell on the group, uh, on the individual uh, health insurance exchange and on the small group market would be required to offer what is a standardized health benefit insurance plan. And in year 2023, they have to offer the standardized plan, which would, which would cover all essential health care benefits at 10% lower premiums than what they are currently costing on average in 2021. And by 2024, they have to reduce premiums by 20%. If they fail to do that, then a public option authority is created and that authority will then sell on the individual market and in the small group market, health insurance policies with standard benefits that are 20% lower than what they are right now on average in 2021. That bill is opposed by all the big pharma folks. It's opposed by big hospitals. 
It's opposed by big health insurers. And so it's a real uphill battle with that bill. And that bill has also gone through some changes over time. It was first introduced back in 2019. And at that point, it was simply standardized plans that were going to be run by insurance companies, but created the terms of the plan would be created by the Department of Insurance, and they would cover all essential health benefits, and they would have to do the 10% and 20% reductions, but they would be able to, you know, basically uh, make money on these plans. The current iteration of the public option bill will create a real public option. It will create a real public authority that will put these uh, insurance policies on the market, and people will pay a premium for them, and they will be far less costly than what the private health insurance industry is currently offering. So the opposition is really strong to this bill, which is another reason why we want to support it. So that's kind of the, the main kind of aspect of the bill. Like I say, it's been going, undergoing some changes because of all this opposition. The most recent change is that Dylan Roberts announced in the last few days that he would amend the bill uh, to not require that providers be, in, be included in the scheme to limit provider reimbursement fees. That was an essential aspect of the bill originally to try to keep down the cost of premiums because it would be kind of like Medicare limiting provider fees according to a specified fee schedule that would be developed by this public agency. Uh, that raised such a bunch of opposition, especially from mental health providers, that he is now going to amend it and allow them, allow everyone but big hospitals to opt out of this standardized plan, this public plan. So the status right now is a little unclear. Uh, the bill has a lot of limitations. We're not crazy about this bill, but it is a true public option bill. It would be a nonprofit bill. No health insurance companies would make any money on it, uh, and people would be able to buy into it. It would probably benefit perhaps maybe 20,000 of the uninsured now would be able to buy into it, maybe more than that, uh, because if you combine it with the newest Recovery Act that Biden has gotten through Congress, uh, the numbers would probably be much higher than, than the 20,000. There are about almost 400,000 Coloradans who are uninsured. So 20,000 uh, uninsured that would be able to buy into that is not a really big progressive bill, but it does benefit a substantial number of people and it does give people a taste for a true nonprofit uh, public insurance option. So we support that bill. Uh, are there any questions about that? Nita, Nita, I okay. think you're yeah. on. So, thanks, Jim. So, what are the talking points of the opposition so that we have to counter that in conversations? Well, uh, you know, it's government takeover of health care. It's uh, telling uh, providers uh, who they can treat. Uh, it is limiting their freedom to, uh, you know, decide which patients they want to cover. Uh, you know, the other objections that they have are that, you know, frankly, it interferes with the free market, the so-called free market in healthcare. As we all know, there's no real free market in healthcare. And so they bring up a lot of the mythology of the free market in their propaganda against this bill. So that's, that's the main opposition. They also don't like the fact that uh, it, it, it does compete directly with the insurance industry, and they don't like that either. And they know 
that with a public option, they're going to lose in that battle of competition. They won't be able to pay their chief executive officer $30 million a year if they want to compete with a public option bill where you have a public servant whose salary is going to be, what, $150,000 a year uh, versus $30 million a year. And they won't have, and they don't like the idea that they won't be able to profit, profit from narrow networks, high deductibles, co-pays, and all of the other gimmicks that they use to make profit from people's uh, sickness uh, and, and poor health. So that's really the story of this bill. Uh, it's still, like I say, it, it's facing a lot of opposition, a lot of big money. Uh, even before this this latest iteration of the bill was introduced this year. The health insurers, the partnership for, you know, American health care, whatever, uh, spent $4.8 million even before the draft bill came out opposing it. If you go on Google and you, and you uh, search for health care, the first thing that pops up is an ad against the public option brought to you by all the big health insurance companies and all the big pharma companies who are part of this coalition. So Anthem, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, you know, the whole raft of profiteers in the healthcare industry are against this bill, which frankly is another reason to be for it. You know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, uh, is the rationale for being in favor of this bill, even though it's somewhat limited in its scope. Terry, did you have a question about premiums? You're on mute, Terry. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm just looking for the average cost because when the exchange happened and you know there's an awful lot of people in the serving industry that don't get insurance my daughter looked into it but you know we're talking about they wanted two hundred dollars a month on a eighteen hundred dollar a month salary and, and she just wouldn't pay it that's too much money for somebody that's not making anything but basically fifteen dollars an hour with tips so what's the average cost do you know? Well, it's hard to say because it yeah. all depends on how many people are in the risk pool. Right. Uh, and that's somewhat undetermined at this point. But they did do some calculations. Uh, in a kind of an unusual move, they, uh, the department or the, the uh, legislative council uh, issued what was called a demographic note. Now, we all know about fiscal notes that describe what it's going to cost for a bill. They actually did what they called a demographic note, and it just came out last week. And what they did in the demographic note uh, is that they went through all the health care statistics of the uninsured in Colorado, the insured, the number of people, the ethnic distribution of the uninsured and the insured. Uh, it's kind of an interesting study, but it's all very vague because it's difficult to know uh, exactly how many people are gonna be able to join up with it. And like I say, the Recovery Act money that's gonna increase uh, ACA subsidies is gonna have a big impact on how many uninsured will be able to buy into it because they'll be able to buy it and connect for Colorado and get subsidies to help them. But in general, what they're saying is, you know, and this is, little more than a guess that the average uh, standard plan is going to cost about six thousand dollars a year uh, that's that's what their latest numbers are but like I say they could be wildly inaccurate right Jim uh, this is Cleo um, yeah I, can I understand hospitals in this state charge more than any other state, to my knowledge. Our hospitals just charge much more. Is that not true? 
It's true of front range hospitals, the big ones. That's not so much true of uh, rural hospitals who yeah. are struggling. Yeah, I think it will exist. So, so, and, and um, my assumption is that, that the front range hospitals are fighting against this as well, right? Against well, yeah. the public They are part of this, uh, right. They're part of this coalition. So we're not even talking about bringing their prices it's, in line with other, with other hospitals. No, and they like to build, uh, you know, big, uh, you know, terrariums in the front of their hospitals and have uh, uh, wonderful lobby entrances. And you, know, you can see the, the incredible waste that goes into a lot of the big hospital chains uh, in just the way that they spend their money. Not only on just extravagant architectural display, but in terms of executive salaries and all of that. I know I used to work at the new, uh, so the new outfit, Anthony's in, in Lakewood, and that was like going into a, a, a hotel <laughs> with a piano player and everything else. So I know, but, but the other thing I can tell you from working in some of these hospitals, especially like medical center of Aurora, um, when they would talk to the employees, they didn't talk to us as if we were running a care facility, but as if we were running a business and how we had to make sure that we treated our patients like king and queen so they would like us and come back to us because it really was all about the money. It really wasn't patient care because they cut that from us. We couldn't give the patient care that we needed to give. So yeah, I, I, I hope the public option passes here uh, you know, I really hope it does. Yeah, that is the hope. It won't be Shangri-La. It won't be universal health care. It's not going to be Medicare for all. Uh, but, like I said, it is at least in advance. Anyone else have any questions? Okay, looks like we're we're good. Is is everybody on the, who's still here okay? It since we've recorded this with pushing this out on our Facebook group page. I'm fine. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Nita, okay, no objections. And we talked about it at the beginning too. So if anybody left, it was, I know Kate was here at the beginning, so she did not object to it. So anyway, this is another great informative session. Thank you everyone so much for attending and, and Owen, let us know how we can, uh, we can get a copy of this. Um, yeah probably be on you if everybody's good with it um which they are and i don't think there's anything to check um it'll be on youtube um later tonight it takes Perfect. an hour probably to process it okay all right and you can shoot me a link in slack or e or post it to our group yeah like i can okay. post it and um you know it's yeah okay all right this was great thank you uh, to our presenters. I learned so much every time we do one of these. So I appreciate your time. May, it just makes thank me you, mad. <laughs> now yeah, that I'm all you. mad, I'm going to have to try and go to bed mad. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Uh, thank I also you. dropped a thank link you. to a bill that's coming to Colorado concerning uh, exotic pet trade performance, you know, like circle, circus animals and stuff. So check that out. It, it looks like it's pretty promising. Thank you. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm all in, so. Yeah, you and me both. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And, all um, right. you know, just to follow up, I put a link in the chat. Uh, I can put it in again, um, I think of, um, 
of Chris Hansen's uh, special <laughs> interest contributions. Um, and, you know, Clean Slate has that for most local candidates on cleanslatenowaction.org. But um, I will uh, um, post it again in the chat right now. Um, and that's, that's the 2020 data for Chris Hansen. Um, but lots of other data on that site for other races, other candidates. And remember, if you want to save what's in the chat, go down to the bottom right hand corner, click on the ellipsis, and there's the save chat option. All right, everybody, be safe Bye. out there. Don't Have go good to bed. Night. Man. Good night. I try not Bye. to. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Bye. Have a good Bye. one. Bye. Bye.